Welcome to another episode of Two Outspoken. I'm Mehdi Hassan. I'm Owen Jones. We are talking this week, Owen, about the only story in the United Kingdom right now. You guys are having another election. Election fever is well and truly sweeping the nation. Uh, just so we're very clear, that was heavily laden with sarcasm. Um, very odd, strange uh, situation we're in because uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, a prime minister who at the moment is slightly less popular than the bubonic plague, decided to call a general election in which he will be annihilated. He's about 21 points behind now. He's just five weeks ago. It's not looking good for the guy. Uh, but with a Labour opposition for which there is less than no enthusiasm for, which is going to win by default, uh, Rishi Sunak falling apart, Labour purging its internal opponents. Bizarre. So I saw Rishi Sunak announce the July 4th election, which of course is Independence Day in the US. It could be his Independence Day. Uh, from a career in government that didn't last so long. He stood outside in the rain, drenched. I don't know why no one could give him an umbrella, why he couldn't move indoors, but he stood in the rain to launch his election campaign. But things I hear went further downhill. Owen, I'm in the United States of America. I've not lived in the UK for nine years. I know there's been, what, five Tory prime ministers in the last nine years at the time I've been away, one every two years, although Liz Truss kind of flatters that average. Um, Did sooner really then start his campaign by going to way, going to a pub full of Welsh people and asking them if they're looking forward to the European Championships, even though Wales hasn't qualified. This, this did actually happen. Yeah, he got rained on because umbrellas are woke. So he had to get absolutely drenched um, and then decided to ask uh, some Welsh citizens. His, his rapport with the general public is not good at the best of times, Meddy. Robo, um, robo. Robo, I think, I think under underplays the problem he's got. And um, he uh, he once was famously spoke to some uh, young students about his Coke problem, by which he meant he liked Coca Cola, but he kept going about his Coke problem. And um, he he also uh, did this big speech in which the cameras were uh, fixed on his back because nobody had told him that he had to speak to the cameras. Uh, but yes, he did speak. He went to Northern Ireland where they don't vote. In any case, for, they can't vote for the Conservatives. Uh, it's separate from the election yes. um, in terms of who people could vote for. Did he go to Northern Ireland? I read this. I can't believe this is true. Did he go to somewhere called the Titanic Quarter? Yes, he did. He stood in front. You can just imagine the photographers. They can't believe their luck. They've got the Prime Minister of a sinking campaign and he's invited them all to a Titanic um, exhibition. They all. He also then kept standing by the exit sign, which was also appropriate. It's not looking every day. That problem is he's got to a situation where every day it's getting worse. He tried playing football with some young kids. The guy's a geek. He should lean into that. He can't kick a ball around. Neither can I. But I'm not doing photo ops of me disastrously kicking a ball about. So we can agree he's not going to be prime minister on July the 5th. How big is the Labour victory going to be in your view? To Tories, just for people watching globally who aren't aware of what happened in 2019, a man called Boris Johnson, remember him? led the Tories to a pretty big win. It was Labour's worst defeat since 1935 under Jeremy Corbyn. Boris Johnson won a majority with the Tories of, what, 80 seats? What's 80 it going to be exactly. this time round for Labour? Oh, it's going to be a whopping big majority. The, the Conservatives have just destroyed themselves more comprehensively than any government ever in British democratic history. They broke the rules during COVID, their own rules. They were getting, they were parting so much, they were vomiting down the walls. People couldn't hold the hands of their dying relatives here. Uh, he was forced out because of that and many other scandals. Uh, they had a, a complete lunatic called Liz Truss take over, detonate the economy with right-wing economic policies. The worst squeeze in living standards ever recorded. The National Health Service falling apart. We could go on. Any of these individually would be enough to finish them off. They've gone through three prime ministers now in the space of one parliament with no election. So they're a mess. They're going to destroy themselves. The problem is, it's really interesting. Keir Starmer is leader of the Labour Party. And soon, by the way, Rishi Sunak will be the Americans' problem. He's second. He's, tw he's <laughs> twice as rich as the king. And he's just going to go off to California and spend the rest of his life being rich in, in California. Keir Starmer's going to become prime minister by default, but no leader of the opposition has been so unpopular and gone on to win an election. And this guy's not just going to win. He's going to win big. And that's what's so astonishing. Labour's not presented any clear alternative vision at all. They've said basically they'll keep the same economic policies. They won't increase taxes on the rich. Uh, they won't uh, borrow to invest. So austerity will they, continue. They seem busy just dealing with their own internal issues and basically just obsessing 
over what's happening inside the Labour Party. I saw a tweet you posted which first alerted me to the story of uh, Faiza Shaheen, uh, a Labour parliamentary candidate who has been suspended this week uh, because she liked a tweet. Owen, break it down for us. You're not. Even, some people probably listen to this and think probably maybe he's exaggerating here. He's probably come on. He's there's got to be more than this. The, no, there isn't really. Faisal Shaheen is someone you think in a political party. She's sort of woman. Uh, she who you want at front and center of the of a political party. She's the daughter. Um, of a mechanic. Um, she is a Muslim woman of colour who defied extraordinary odds. Um, she became a flourishing academic and um, also on broadcast and television. The last election, when it went very badly for Labour, it swung in her direction. Um, now she's on the left of the Labour Party. She's very charismatic. So all of a sudden, she's there with holding a newborn baby out campaigning surrounded by enthusiastic volunteers people are very committed to her and then suddenly her phone's blowing up because someone's leaked to a murdoch owned newspaper by which i mean that labor officials that she's been purged she won't be able to stand and the reasons and include liking a tweet which explains a john stewart sketch uh, in which he explains how you get yelled at on twitter by pro-israel people when you criticize israel we'll start tonight in in the middle east where Israel... What? Israel isn't supposed to defend itself? Oh, yeah, if Mexico bombed Texas, will we exercise... What other countries held to the same standard as Israel? Israel. People that want to destroy right. our terrorism? What is the matter with the only democracy in the Middle East, you Self-hating Jew? That was... That was weird. Anyway, what I was... What I was saying was last Thursday saw the start of a new ground offensive launched by Israel. Oh, oh no, the Tradition! Tradition! Look, obviously there are there are many strong opinions on, on this issue, but just merely mentioning Israel or questioning in any way the effectiveness or humanity of Israel's policies is not the same thing as being pro-Hamas. So you're against murder children? Free Gaza! Free Zionist pig! <laughs> you know what? Why don't we just talk about something lighter, like, uh, Ukraine? Yeah, I'm good with that. So that was Jon Stewart years ago. It's an old clip and a tweet describing what's happening in the clip and the intensity with which pro-Israeli figures, the pro-Israel lobby, people in the media uh, go crazy uh, if you dare criticize Israel or, or say things that people don't want to hear. And that gets her suspended. And I was so furious uh, when I saw your tweet about this and then I spoke to Pfizer on DM and heard what was going on and watched her Newsnight interview that I then tweeted at Jon Stewart saying, hey, Jon Stewart, can you believe that this is going on? You're part of the UK election race. And Jon Stewart, bless his heart, responded with a hilarious tweet. Uh, he was pretty angry, it seemed like, saying this is the dumbest decision, most effed up decision uh, the UK did since they elected Boris Johnson. Has that had any impact in the UK? And it's got totally viral. I mean, I, I hope it has but just because John Stewart in Labour circles is is kind of held up in very high yes. regard. I mean, look, the problem is with a lot of Labour aides is they they spend so much time watching the West Wing that they think they're yeah. in the West Wing and they're not in the West Wing. But they also love John Stewart. I mean, every you know that he kind of crosses the, the Atlantic in particularly political circles. So I hope it's embarrassed them, but they're without shame. I mean, basically, they're, they're what makes their heart beat a little bit faster is crushing left wing opponents. And you know, the fact she's spoken out um, on Gaza is definitely something which has made them want to get rid of her. There's no question about that. Uh, a lot of the other candidates who are being imposed, I mean, it's not like in the, the US, a lot of these places, the leadership says, I want that person to stand there and nobody has a say over it. That will, That's what will happen in her seat, her constituency. Someone, some random person will just be parachuted in. No one will have voted for them until it goes to the general election. So no equivalent of a primary, nothing. Um, and, you know, a lot of these people support what Israel have done. In fact, uh, someone called Luke Gatekirst, who had something called We Believe in Israel, which is currently lobbying members of the public to demand their MPs support Israel's genocidal onslaught against Gaza. 
He's been parachuted into a seat. And I'd also know, you know, as another example, there's another candidate who got, uh, who, who, um, uh, racially abused a journalist, had a sexual harassment case upheld against him. He's allowed to stand in a candidate. He's a white man, supports Keir Starmer. So when Keir Starmer says, well, actually, this is about the highest quality candidates, if you're a woman of colour who likes a tweet about a John Stewart sketch, you're out, even though you're this amazing academic and yeah. campaign and all the rest. If you're a white guy who supports Keir Starmer and you are literally f suspended because you racially abuse someone and you have a sexual harassment case against, against you, you're good enough to stand. That sums up the modern Labour Party. Here's what's so fascinating. One of the other things they're digging her for is that she praised the Green Party before she was in the Labour Party, which is ironic because I, I get it. You can't be praising other parties if you're in our party. The Labour Party just embraced, did they not, Owen, a Conservative MP who defected. So if, you're a if you were a Conservative MP like 20 minutes ago, you're fine to be in the Keir Starmer Labour Party. But if you praised the Green Party years ago, you can't be. Well, it, it's worse. She wasn't just like a Tory MP. She's one of the most right-wing Tory MPs. Yep. So this would be like a right-wing Republican suddenly crossing the floor, uh, becoming a ardent Democrat, uh, whilst AOC gets somehow purged from the Democrats. I know it doesn't quite work like that in the US, but that would be the equivalent of what would be we're talking about here. Uh, so you've got, you know, she she's there spending years attacking the Labour Party, this Tory MP, for opening the borders and being pro-migrant and, and 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 all the rest. Um, and then uh, you you pick someone out partly because before they were even in the Labour Party, they didn't tweet it out. They liked someone's tweet in 2014, uh, which uh, in which they supported the Green Party. I mean, it's just the world turned on its head. These are just nasty people. I'll just be honest. They're nasty people. They're just finding any reason to just boot out anyone they don't like. And it's, it's going to, right now, they're going to get their big majority. They're full of hubris. But anyone who's watched Greek tragedy knows hubris, nemesis pride before fall and when they're when they're in government they don't have a vision they don't have ideas they've just got a lot of factional spite it's going to fall apart you yeah. mentioned gaza in the context of pfizer and you also mentioned the obsession with cracking down on the left and i feel like those two stories came together over the past few months keir starmer's reaction to october 7th was to kind of go all in on supporting israel to the point where he goes on lbc as you've critiqued many times and talked about defending Israel's right to blockade food and water, which is uh, the International Court of Justice does not agree with. The International Criminal Court now uh, has received a p arrest warrant applications from the chief prosecutor for alleged crimes that Keir Starmer totally supported before he kind of U-turned. He's now gone the other way, um, and he's telling Benjamin Netanyahu this week in the wake of the massacre in the tents in Rafa, stop. Is this, a, is this another Keir Starmer U-turn? No, not really. What he does, Keir Starmer, is he kind of follows as far as the US State Department will let him. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's basically just waits to see how far they'll go and see how much space that gives him. At the beginning, you're right. He supported the right of Israel to commit war crimes. That is what cutting off water and energy means. Hence, as you know, in the International Criminal Court, chief prosecutors request for an arrest warrant for Yov Gallant and Benjamin Netanyahu in the Israeli leadership because they cut off water and energy. That's clearly in the request for the arrest warrant. Then he denied he never said that. What he says now, you know, on it's about Rafa. Well, the US came out and said that they oppose a major onslaught on Rafa and, and Keir Starmer's just echoing that. That's all he's doing. But it, it, the, the thing is, this is what's really important it, about, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't care about rhetoric. He doesn't care about words. You know, within reason. I mean, actually, they're you know they're tempestuous. They don't you know anyone who crosses them in any way, they'll 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 kick off. But actually, when it comes to just saying, well, stop in Rafa, Benjamin and Yahoo, I don't care. What what journalists don't ask Keir Starmer, and this just shows the failure of a lot of the British media, it's the same in the US, is are you going to stop arms sales to um Israel? Given we know they're in violation of international humanitarian law, Britain should do that anyway. That should that's the rule, that's the official rule of the government. So it, it it's just empty rhetoric. What I do, I'm interested though, because because I'm saying they're kind of following what the US are doing here. I want to know what you think about where Joe Biden's pitching, because that, I mean, that partly selfishly, because where Biden goes, yes. Starmer will follow. He'll just do exactly what what Biden says in office. But has he moved it? He had his big red line on Rafa, and now he's seen this hideous, hideous burning to death of kids, decapitating of babies. That that, that didn't cross the red line. So what what is anything going to move here? Red line, the pink line, the no line. Yeah, the lines are there are no lines, and 
What's been so depressing is the State Department and the National Security Council, the White House, they were pretty silent for the first 24, 36 hours after Sunday night's barbarism. Uh, even though Macron in France, for example, came out quite strongly saying this needs to stop now. And then John Kirby, who's turned out to be one of the most disingenuous and cynical of spinners on behalf of this administration, uh, he took to the podium this week and was asked about, you know, is this a major offensive? Because that's how they're defining when we've crossed the red line. You know, aren't there tanks in Rafa? Have a listen to what he had to say. Israeli tanks just moved into central Rafa. How is that not a major military operation? Well, again, I don't want to talk about Israeli Defense Force operations, but my understanding is, and I believe the Israelis have spoken to this, um, that they are moving along something called the Philadelphia Corridor, which is on the outskirts of the town, not in the town proper. That's what the Israelis have said. Owen, John Kirby is saying it's not a major offensive as tanks roll into Rafa. There are no tanks in Rafa, even though there are tanks in Rafa. So you mentioned earlier Keir Starmer telling us to forget what we saw and hear him say on LBC at the start of the conflict. John Kirby wants us not to look at the tanks that are on the screens of CNN and are on YouTube and are all over our phones and are documented by geolocation. And I look at John Kirby and I think, Comical Ali. Do you remember Comical Ali, Baghdad Bob, Mohammed as Sahaf, the Saddam Hussein's information minister during 2003, who stood outside in Baghdad and said, There are no Americans in Baghdad, even as you could kind of hear tanks rolling into Baghdad over his shoulder. That's what's, what, that's what's happened to the White House now. They've become Saddam Hussein level propaganda. Well, kind of Comical Ali without the charm. I don't know. Yes. Comical Ali, but kind of, he was called Comical Ali. This is kind of funny. And this guy, I don't know, this, this really nasty cold, clinical gaslighting. I mean, that's what they're doing is gaslighting. They're trying to say, don't listen to your lying ears and your lying eyes. And the reason they have to do this, Benny, let's be honest, is you have to upend reality if you're going to end up legitimizing Israel's genocidal onslaught against Gaza, because it is obviously one of the great crimes of our time, one of the great atrocities. It is a, backed up by overtly repeated genocidal rhetoric by Israeli political and military leaders and um, um, soldiers, media outlets, we could go on. Um, and they have visibly wiped Gaza from the face of the earth with only Rafa remaining as any built up settlement, basically not be completely crushed. They're clearly slaughtering thousands of innocent people, including kids all of the time. The only way you can possibly sustain legitimizing and carry on legitimizing support for this is to gaslight, deflect, and to lie. That's what the Israeli state does. They, they've turned that to an art form. I mean, they, an atrocity happens, and then they they lie about it. They deflect. Uh, they get, they muddy the waters, and they hope people just move on and then just think, oh, let, it's all in the fog of war. Who's to know what really happened? That's their strategy. And the US are there to back them up. I mean, they, I don't know what you think. They, I just think all of this is just, you know, public opinion has shifted despite much of the media going along with this. But actually, you know, it's such an obvious a crime, which is why the IC, International Criminal Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court are involved, despite the world order being rigged in favour of the West. I don't know. That's all they got, isn't it? That's all they got, lies. That's all they got, lies, but it, it's, it's worse than kind of just backing them up. They know they can't back them up by saying what they did wasn't wrong, because only the Israelis can claim it's not wrong. And the rest of the world, as you say, eyes, ears, we're seeing what's happening. So what they do instead, of course, Owen, is they say, well, we've asked the Israelis to investigate. And Matthew Miller at the State Department has been saying that all week. David Cameron on Twitter, the foreign secretary in the UK, former prime minister, has been tweeting about how we expect a, what was his line? I think I wrote it down because it was so absurd. A swift, comprehensive and transparent investigation. Has he ever followed an Israeli investigation? They're not swift. They're not transparent. They're not comprehensive. In fact, according to NPR radio here in the US, of the 1,200 complaints against Israeli soldiers for wrongdoing between 2017 and 2021, do you know how many of them ended up in indictment? I think it's, a, less, it's 11, 11. Less than, a, yeah, less than a percentage point, less than 1% of the over 1,200 complaints. So this idea that Israel can investigate itself is absurd. That is why we need the ICJ and the ICC, and that's why Israel uh, is losing its shit, as I've said before, over the idea of an independent international external uh, investigation. Before we finish, Owen, I've got to ask you this. One thing I don't miss about the UK is a lot of the UK media. Mm. And what I really don't miss about the UK media is the constant amplification, especially every time an election rolls around, of a guy who has never, ever been elected to parliament 
but seems to kind of loom over every election, every political debate, every conversation. He's on Preston Time Thursday night. He was on Sky last Sunday. Nigel Farage, former UKIP leader, now with this Reform UK party, the kind of new, uh, you know, uh, the new version of UKIP, I guess you could call it. And he was on Sky, Owen, on Sunday. And I don't watch much British television anymore, but this clip is one that really came across my social media. And I was just, even by my cynical standards, truly shocking. And most interestingly, we have a growing number of young people in this country who do not subscribe to British values, in fact, loathe much of what we stand for. So what do you do? Who are we talking about there? Oh, I think we see them on the streets of London every Saturday. What do they Um, look like? Oh, we're talking about... What do they look like? Are we talking about Muslims here? We are. Uh, And and I'm afraid I found some of the recent surveys saying that 46% of British Muslims support Hamas, support a terrorist organisation, that is prescribed in this country. So we've been, you know, and, and, and what's interesting we, is that this Prime Minister, we, this Prime Minister is building up we, far more of that population than anybody before in history. I mean, it's just naked Islamophobia. It's just loud and proud, unapologetic, anti-Muslim bigotry. And, you know, that's always been, it's interesting, side of Arsi, who's a conservative um, politician, one of, I think, the most senior female um Muslim politician in the country, uh, you know, she she's repeatedly very well put uh, that Islamophobia is acceptable and mainstream in British society. And that is fanned by the right wing media here. It's fanned, obviously, by conservative politicians and it's fanned by the likes of Nigel Farage. Now, I don't want to play that if it was another minority game. Uh, what I would say is, you know, clearly, if he'd said the same thing about, say, Jewish people, there would rightly be huge uproar and outrage. I don't think anyone would dispute that. I think it would be seen as obscene anti-Semitism. It would be. It is in that sense. Of course, it'd be obscene anti-Semitism. How can you just speak about an entire minority in these sweeping terms? Um, And, and, you know, this has consequences. We know, you know, when previously Boris Johnson um, made comments about Muslims where he said he he ridiculed uh, women who who wore the veil and compared them to letterboxes and bank robbers. And there was a massive increase in hate crimes, including people trying to shove letters um, in the faces of Muslim women. This has huge consequences um, and it it is an acceptable mainstream um, position to have. And yes, Nigel Farage, you know, he's, he's on the further right. But it's not just him legitimizing. There's a whole kind of industry here. What's so depressing about that clip, and by the way, I hate to play the, if it was another minority, game, but it's the only way to get through to people and show them how normalized Islamophobia has become. Because saying Muslims don't share our values doesn't shock people. A lot of people think that, or they think, well, that's an acceptable part of our discourse. And about 15, more than 15 years ago, I made a documentary when I was at Channel 4 with Peter Oborn. And it was called It Shouldn't Happen to a Muslim. And one thing we did was we got actual news headlines, Owen, from the Express and the Mail and the Sun about Muslims. And we changed the word Muslim to gay, black and Jewish. And Peter went around a shopping center in Essex holding up the boards. And people were like, oh, that's shocking. And then he turned it around and said, this is the original. And they were like, oh. And that was a reminder 15, 20 years ago uh, of just how normalized this has become. And I think it was 2011 when Saeed Avasi talked about it passing the dinner table test. What's Mm. so depressing about that clip, though, is it's Nigel Farage being given another platform. And the guy interviewing him, Trevor Phillips, who, to be fair, in that clip does push back against Farage, has his own history of Islamophobic remarks. And that's just how ingrained Islamophobia is in the media, that we've got kind of hierarchies of Islamophobia even in one conversation about Muslims. He was actually suspended from the Labour Party, Trevor Phillips. He was the interviewer because of his own Islamophobic comments. In fact, himself condemned by Baron Saeed of Arsi, who is, we've just both ad- spoke with a lot of admiration. Doesn't It takes a lot for me to speak in, in glowing terms about a conservative politician. But, you know, she's, she's right. She was right about Nigel Farage. She's right about Islamophobia in society. And she's right um, about Trevor Phillips. And you just end up with this perverse <laughs> world where you've got a, a presenter with a history of being called out for his Islamophobia, um, interrogating a politician being overtly Islamophobic. I mean, I mean come on. And meanwhile, a Muslim woman running for parliament is suspended for anti-Semitism because she liked a John Stewart video. Well, not just that. that. Do you know what? She also liked, she also tweeted condemning the hierarchy 
um, of racism over Islamophobia, but in la in Labour and broader society. And she was condemned over that. And then the Labour Party approved it. Labour Party approved it. Um, we are what six weeks less than six weeks out. From five. The election? Five weeks five. out. The election. Five weeks today. Owen. Five weeks today. It's times like this. I do not miss living in the UK, but I appreciate you being in the UK to tell us what is happening, how crazy it all is. And that's why we should stay outspoken as we do on this show. I'm Mehdi Hassan. And I'm Owen Jones. We'll see you next time.